Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I am here with part two of the Mystic Cards for our reading today and the rest of the Juturna packs from this box. And I'm taking forever to get through this box. I apologize. So let's get through the lore and then I want to talk about the word ascendancy because we've seen that word before. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Here is the beautiful Kerrigan. Melancholic melodies swell around this member of Dyke's noble house as she weaves haunting sonatas across cryptic island. Kerrigan's nickname, Songbird, is a playful derivative of her magic, which takes the form of ethereal birds. Renowned among the Bar Bardic Craig, Kerrigan's performances have attracted citizens of every faction, leading to her concerts becoming informal political galas. The most compassionate member of the Nyadine, she often plays the role of confidant or crying shoulder. Dex's carefully composed aura of serenity comforts those who visit her domain. Many mystics come to Dex just to sit with her by a waterfall and hold her hand as they vent their anxieties. Though she has never thought of using any of the secrets entrusted to her for her own gain, Dex possessed a plethora of gossip that could topple the power structure of the mystic faction. Leader of the Nidim, Rhea's grip on the affluent group of illusionists amounts to that of a deeply entrenched cult leader. While her house theoretically serves Dithes, Rhea has been undermining their, their authority since she was young, encouraging the Nidim to magically adapt their body to the water as she has gradually grown their ranks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Residing with her followers is an idyllic phantasmal realm of their own design, she has effectively usurped Dithi without having to face the wrath of the nobility. The musically inclined illusionist Makimi is equally beautiful and cynical. Younger sister of Danae, Rhea's right-hand woman, she is under constant pressure to join the ranks of the Nidine. Her allegiance to her childhood friend and musical compatriot Kerrigan has kept her grounded and painfully aware of the disruption that the Nine Deem have caused to their Lady Dithy and the glory of their role as mystic illusionists. Torn between family and friend, honor and surrender, her songs grow darker by the day. The star pupil of Muriel, Moxie, Moxie is capable of spells that would make even the most seasoned mage green with envy. <clears throat> Excuse me, through pure determination and willpower, rather than natural talent, she surpassed her peers. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Although Moxie is a self professed bookworm, she finds time to socialize at the Bardic Craig, performances across Cryptic Island. Eventually, she believes she will build up enough courage to introduce herself to her favorite performer, Tocho. <laughs> That's interesting. Tocho is in the undead faction. <clears throat> Uniquely gifted to channel spells through weapons, Azara wields a magical jade stone sword that empowers the spells unleashed from the blade. As part of the revivalist initiative, Azara has been tasked with bringing new military and agricultural knowledge from other factions back to the mystics. She shares her magical expertise with the Accord in exchange for military tactics and strategies, and can be found with the with humans such as Boudicca or Selene, trying to demonstrate the utility of magic in combat. A vicious and sadistic woman, the illusionary domain Azizi has woven, is a disorienting underwater forest. Finding pleasure in the distress of her prey, she enjoys their confused calls for help as they wake up within her lair and try to escape. Exemplary of the violent aspects of hedonism that arise from the indulgence of the Nyadine, nobody can be sure of the number of threats to their secrets that have met their brutal end in her grasp. The living shield Einar is also <clears throat> a being of restrained will, similar to Kushiel. His armor appears fused to his body and his blade has never left his side. 
He is enchanted and empowered by magics that are contingent on him, defending the living key, the repository, and the royal patron Hona to the death of a singular mind to do Hona's bidding. No being has ever crossed their family has lived long enough to benefit from it. Calm and measured, Hona is the head of the youngest noble house in the mystic faction. Not only is she an expert at maneuvering political landscapes of cryptic island, but she's an adept sorceress. So skilled is Hona that she has prepared a spell to function posthumously if she meets an untimely end. Unfortunately, magic can be a fickle thing, so exactly what will happen to Hona's essence or soul is unknown. The Warden, Pollux, is the master of the ethereal prison of the mystics. The magical chains that he controls have many functions, ranging from silencing victims to channeling spells. These chains also serve as effective interrogation tools, which he uses frequently to garner information. He is a loyal servant to Pasha, which has led to friction with Davy, as the old sea captain continually gets closer to her. Isla is the youngest of the nineteen, passionate, sly, and libertine. Her illus illusory realm is decorated with mementos of the frail of the trail of heartbreak she weaves. Difficult to pin down both emotionally and physically, she darts through her flowered watery demands, seemingly without a care in the world. She is somewhat perturbed, however, by the changes she sees in Corinna since coming to the island and has been keeping an eye on her friend. I remember Corinna and Amador have a relationship. Amador is one of the human faction. On here's Aurora's sister, our last card. Fredonia exists as an ethereal arcane being, something with tro which troubles her deeply, a creature whose soul is a byproduct of the nurturing and loving aspects of Muriel's soul. She laments her natural form frightens people. Assisted by the Haman Hamanut cultic vessel crafted to keep her <laughs> form a secret, Fredonia is still able to care for those around her, in particular Rosa, who is only a who is only be able to be calmed down by Fredonia, Aurora, or Muriel. Okay, and that's the last of the mystic cards that we have. So Tanner who created Cryptic, one of the creators, was just on a podcast on the Scheming Skeleton YouTube channel with Jordan and George. George, you may know from Kitchen Table TCG's podcast, the May the Zoo Be With You. Um, George does this podcast with Jordan, the, this, um, the Bone Zone. So if you want to go check out Tanner's latest interview, I highly recommend you do. There's a lot of really great information about uh, what they've been through making this game so far and the plans they have for the future. Very cool stuff on the horizon. But Tanner dropped some interesting um, information about the lore. And I I am going to... Oh, there she is. That's beautiful. This is all me, all my speculation. This is nothing that, that Tanner says explicitly, but he mentioned something about the overseers, the ones who brought all of these factions to Cryptic Island. So our overseers are these guys. Apparent, well, I, and I, I have not been keeping up with the lore other than to read what I've read to you, the comics and the lore cards. I unfortunately have not had time to be on Discord reading as much as I'd like to, but there is a huge section that's very active, the, the lore channel in the Cryptic Discord. And the, they have been doing a lot of um, speculating with the Cryptic Doc, who basically created a lot of the lore and embellished on the lore along with one of the other Cryptic uh, team members. And there's Kerrigan. One of the more beautiful foils and cards, in my opinion. Anyway, so Tanner said that there are multiple overseers. I think we kind of knew that. And every 11 years, there is a judgment. So when people or factions, people, realms are brought to the island from 
other places, planets, or, or wherever, every 11 years, they, whoever was has been there for the full 66, they're judged. And apparently while they're on the island, they don't age, which I thought was interesting. Um, but he said that if the overseers find somebody worthy after their time on the island and they survive the 66 years, they ascend. Well, there's a card. I'm not sure we saw it just now. I'm not paying attention because I'm rambling. Called Charlie's Ascendancy. So I'm wondering if at some point in the lore, as the game continues to unfold and we continue to get new sets and new lore with each set, if she's going to ascend as, and become an overseer, that would be an interesting thing. So, I, well, yeah, well, he said that word, he said ascendancy and, and that that would happen. Now, the other thing that um, that makes me question is, are the overseers able to die? So if they are looking for people to replace or add to their ranks as time goes on, as far as why they're doing this, why are they gathering people and, and judging them other than to possibly add to their own ranks. I, I don't know what the ultimate goal is for them as a group. So that's something we should, we should learn over time. Whoops, missed a lore card. So yeah, I thought, I thought that was interesting, but that's, that's just my speculation about the possibility of, of what Charlie's ascendancy means as a card, because we also know from the cryptic doc that these spell cards are events that have happened either past, present, or future. So it's very possible that Charlie's ascendancy happens, and that's something that, that we see, that she ascends to an overlord. And in that case, do we follow her to her new overlord status, if that's what happens to her? Or do we just not know for a while? It's, it's, it's interesting to, to speculate on those things. I'm, I'm not sure what to make of that. As far as Juturna, I fully expect that we'll lose her at some point as well because of the, the comic, the, the chapter about the mystics where Queen Caitlin is getting ready to leave this realm, I guess die basically, and her powers go to Juturna. So I'm, I'm interested to see what happens there or if she manages to make it to her judgment on the island and ascends as well, but we, we don't, we don't know. We don't know. Um, but yeah, it, I, I fully expect that, that Jaterna will, will be uh, an interesting story to follow because she is now queen of the mystics, has all that power and knowledge given to her by Caitlin and, and at her end, and uh, we'll see what happens. Not to mention all the other twists and turns of the lore that we're seeing in the lore cards and hints of of relationships and hints of struggles and wars and rumors of wars, not very much unlike our own, our own world. But that's all I've got for you guys today. Tell me your speculations. If you are a lore seeker on the Discord and you're watching this and laughing at me, please, please tell me. <laughs> please tell me if I'm completely off. <laughs> because I really don't know. And that lore channel, if I try to go back to the beginning of it, uh, I'll be there for, for days and days reading everything. So I just, I unfortunately don't have time for that. I wish I did. But I hope you all are doing great. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And I'll see you next time. We will, <clears throat> we will delve into the realms of the undead. That should be fun. Learn more about this guy, Wolfric and Tocho and I can't wait to see. Uh, we've seen a glimpse of Tocho's new card in Wave 2. He looks like he's a lot of fun. All right, guys. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Take care.